Howdy! Today, we're looking at Strain, a megawad released in 97 by the Alpha Dog Alliance. Sounds like a group of pickup artists, but it actually consisted of some rather well-known mappers, including some of the people behind Memento Mori 2, Requiem, and the Serenity series. This wasn't the B-team, in other words, and their ambition was about as grand as you'd expect. In an interview with Doom World, Project Lead Charlie Patterson basically says they were trying to create Doom 3, or at the very least improve upon Doom 2. Yeah, we'll see how they fared. Now on to map 1, Barracks, by Bill McClendon. Right off the bat, you get a taste of Strain's extensive de-hacked bullshit. The start gives you no bullets, but it's okay, because you get to use both fists now. You know, for when you really want to goat see one of these assholes. It does get pretty fun when you pick up the Berserk pack, because both punches get the upgrade. And you'll find one in this very stage, no less. Well, theoretically, anyway. Let's address one of the many elephants in the room. This wad is filled to bursting with secrets and puzzles, and they run the gamut from benign, to clever, to obtuse, to fucking nonsense. This one, for example, which requires you to shoot a monitor for some reason, and after playing some later maps, you may be inclined to shoot your actual monitor. Back to the D-hack stuff. The pistol fires faster, and so does the shotgun, now called a sawed-off. It also loses the front sight and kind of looks like a steel weenie as a result. As for the map itself, standard tech base. Nothing to write home about unless you make it a priority to punch everything. Next. Map 2, Outskirts, by Bjorn Hermans. The gimmickry is already out in full force. There's a large fortress to explore, and as you make your way through and around it, you'll trip a multitude of line defs and switches. These in turn raise floors, open doors, and generally change the layout, so you can make your way towards the exit at the center. Now that I've gone through it a few times, it's more linear than it first appears, but my initial playthrough you know, is like being lost at the mall when you're a kid. Daunting, confusing, and I may have cried a little bit near the end. Combat, on the other hand, is fairly rote. You'll be introduced to the skinless demon here. He's red, has a few more health points than normal. I didn't know having your skin cut off could make you stronger, but I'm sure my penis will appreciate the good news. Practically speaking, it doesn't make much of a difference besides soaking up more ammo. Final verdict. Cute idea, mediocre execution. Next. Map 3, Downtown, by Florian Helmberger. Damn, that's a great MIDI. Almost sounds like something you'd hear in Duke 3D. Whole wad comes with a custom soundtrack, with Mark Clem usually doing the heavy lifting. This banger, on the other hand, called Inner Turmoil, comes courtesy of David Shaw. It may perhaps be too cool for the map it's paired with, which is even less of a downtown than Sandy's little city. More like a nursing home, although the residents are surprisingly spry. Say hello to the Super Imp, or the Class 2 Imp. If Sonic the Hedgehog got ass-fucked by Satan, these doo-doo babies would be the result. They're fast as fuck, and when they spot you, they'll continually hurl fireballs till you break line of sight. However, there's always a delay before they start shooting, or if they enter a pain state, so you've got a brief window to put them down without issue. They're really not that bad, and the best part is that they'll end fight with normal imps and usually die, since they take so long to fire back. You know, I have to give props to the ADA for putting some effort into the new enemies. In that interview I mentioned earlier, Charlie Patterson shit-talks the Doom 2 bestiary, which is why most of them have been replaced. His reasoning is kind of retarded, if I'm being honest, but the team did make a genuine effort to bring different monster mechanics to the table, as opposed to just adding the same monsters but with more health. I don't always like the changes, but they tried, so... Gold Star, I guess. The map is a densely packed series of buildings with a couple of low-intensity gotcha moments. The hardest part is the very beginning, where you're getting swarmed by super imps coming from both directions. If you're lacking for health, look for a Wolfenstein-esque secret in the main structure. Next. Map 4, Industrial Zone, by Adam Windsor. What is it with the ripped-off names? Are you trying to one-up the original? Because if so, good job. I like it. It's a fairly small tech base, but everything crisscrosses and loops around on itself. And there's plenty of light combat to be had. Never a dull moment, especially at the fake exit which drops you into a super imp super orgy. The subverted guard makes his first appearance here. Far as I can tell, it's just a reskinned heavy weapons dude. But as long as I can get my hands on that chain gun, 
You can call it whatever the fuck you want. The doppelganger also rears its, uh, tasty looking head. Seriously, it's like something you get from the ice cream guy. They're lost souls that can shoot imp fireballs. I find this actually makes them a little bit easier because they always belch fire before headbutting you. So it's more like a warning shot that you can easily avoid. Aside from that, place looks nice, especially the toxic area. A lot of good shadow use. Almost has a more modern feel to it. Only downside, the secrets. They're all anemic. It really takes the wind out of your cells when you manage to find one. And the only things inside are a few bonuses. Next, Map 5, Depot, by, oh no, Landis. Okay, so it's not much of a surprise if you recognize Level 4's obnoxious MIDI. John Landis contributed maps and music to the project. The latter are just as idiosyncratic as you'd expect, considering he ripped them directly from his own Eye of the Beholder wads. His first stage, on the other hand, is... Dare I say, disappointingly straightforward? Start in a rectangular building, hit a few switches, hop outside, clear two straight hallways. Then a bunch of gunners and imps teleport back in the main building, but they tend to kill each other off pretty efficiently. With that done, head back in and leave. The only real speed bumps are two secrets that are opened by enemies from the inside, so you will lose access if you don't get in there quickly enough. One of them also contains the new mega armor, which is red and boosts you up to 300%. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem to confer the 50% damage reduction. It's a downgrade in my opinion, although it works just fine on the map as soft as this one. Hmm. I wonder if Landis will make up for it by crafting a claustrophobic, convoluted, cumbersome cunt of a stage. Next. Map 6, Launch Control, by John Landis. Ah, there we go. It's not a Landis map unless I'm getting fucked in the butt by a crazy straw. The start is quite annoying. You got four teleporters that lead to four alcoves and four switches, all of which open four closets full of imps that'll constantly wander into the aforementioned portals. Then you got the main part, different rooms connected by a network of narrow corridors, all of which have these ridges on them for some reason. It looks cool, but they're definitely not ribbed for my pleasure keep getting hung up on the fucking things. First, go west to get your hands on a super shoddy and hidden berserk pack. Now you can head east towards the blue key which takes you to another series of tunnels that run underneath the map. With that out the way, you'll access the final fight, a larger rendition of the beginning teleporter brawl with a few extra bad guys. There's a lot of stuff here that gets on my nerves, like the path leading to the blue key, which is blocked off by blue bars. You're supposed to jump past them, and then when you get the key and come back, you hit a switch that lowers the bars, even though you'll never have to go back down there. These things are just here to fuck with your head, and are also symptomatic of Landis's love for unnecessary switch shenanigans. A lot of wasted time when a simple doorway would suffice. On that note, how about a secret that requires you to press a switch three times? Except you're actually pressing three different switches, and the other two are hidden behind the first one. Or how about the introduction of the Holobot? They're basically floating revenants that move slower, and shoot missiles that move a lot slower. It's dumb. The kicker is that, like I said, Charlie Patterson verbally wiped his ass with Doom 2's new monsters. His reason for not liking the revenant is that the missiles are, quote, so damn fast. He also said that he had to door fight through the entirety of Doom 2, and that, quote, those baby spiders were impossible. I think we have to admit that a lot of these monster changes occurred because the mappers were fucking shit. I mean, yeah, it was the early days, keyboard only, blah, blah, blah. But come the fuck on. Holobots suck and are a poor substitute for everybody's favorite boner. They even look kind of stupid. Although that shouldn't be much of a surprise if you've been eyeing the HUD. I don't know what Doom guy's been turned into, but it looks like a five-year-old with palsy tried to draw a Terminator. And yet, despite all my bitching, I must admit, I actually kind of like this fucking map. Now that I know what I'm doing, it's got a really unique design, and the combat keeps up a steady pace, alternating between drip-fed corridor fights and rooms full of enemies or surprise traps. And of course, it's all buoyed by one of Mark Clem's best, a track called Simple Solutions. You know what? 
I think I may finally be buying what John Landis is selling. Next. Map 7, En Route, by Ad Illusion. Again, Earth is secured. You have successfully slaughtered your way to the lunar shipping station. There is a cargo liner prepped on the launch pad, still spilling out the devil's children it brought on its last journey. You climb aboard, smearing the dirty steel with the blue-red blood from your boots. The black drugs are reaching full effect now. Next stop, the moon. Dark side, Station Daro. Strain has a pretty basic backstory. After the events of Doom and Doom 2, some goofball on the moon augments the demonic horde with new powers, hence the upgraded bestiary. The military, in response, cook up their own experimental augmentation. The downside is that every subject eventually succumbs to a blind, uncontrollable rage. The upside is that there is no fucking downside. Blind, uncontrollable rage is Doom Guy's bread and butter, so he signs up. After a few days of barely contained bloodlust, the base comes under attack and you have to fight your way to the launch pad. Now we find ourselves on a tin can that the game pretends is a cargo liner headed for the lunar base. It's an interstitial map, short and sweet. First, I gotta say, it looks nice. These doors at the beginning, the bulkheads connecting different rooms, the fact that you can see outside into space and into other parts of the ship. The starfield here isn't that great, but the one visible from the bridge is pretty damn good. Oh yeah, there's a bridge. Finally, the exit portal is trippy as hell. This effect is created by sticking a bunch of narrow, scrolling textures next to each other. I got to playing around with it in Doom Builder, and the results were... Interesting. The combat, on the other hand, is bog standard, with a lot of gunners. It's fun for what it is. A breather before the behemoth to come. Next. Map 8. Hangar by Nostromo. I'll say this one more time and leave it at that. These maps get a lot more fun when you know what the hell's going on. My first playthrough of this big fat bastard was confusing and irritating, but it has grown on me. Now there are still a few irksome elements. You're gonna constantly be harangued by enemies that teleport in when you cross invisible line deaths, and they frequently repopulate areas you've already cleared out. There's also the minor maze of hallways leading to the blue key. It's dark, and again, you'll be tripping monster closets left and right. Luckily, there are a couple of secrets in here if you're wall humping. The worst part is after grabbing the key. Four teleporters, only one of them takes you back outside. The others deposit you in a different hallway maze complete with three more teleporters blocking off certain intersections. You gotta puzzle your way out of there, and I about damn near had a conniption fit my first time through. That being said, I was just impatient. Use the auto map and it's not that bad. My final complaint is one that many maps in this water are guilty of. You hit a switch and have no goddamn clue what it does. Get used to retracing your steps. Aside from all that, there's a lot of action here. Eventually, you make your way inside the yellow door. It's another maze, but actually well lit this time. And well stocked with super imps. Yeah, this can get pretty intense, especially if you just dive in there. It's a great showcase for one of the new enemies. Next. Map 9, Cargo Bay, by Ad Illusion. This is actually a reworked version of Map 4 from Dystopia 3. A much improved version, in my opinion, even with the addition of Holobots. This tech base begins with some back and forth button buffoonery before you head outside and wrap around into the cargo bay. It looks neat. The challenge is pretty low but steady. You'll want to keep an eye out for gunners around every corner. There's a couple of surprise closets near the yellow key that would make more of an impression if they had anything besides hollow twats in them. The big fight is after grabbing the red key. You're locked in with a teleporting swarm of cacos and doppelgangers. Just hit the switch and blast your way to safety if it starts to overwhelm you. Chances are an infight will spring up anyway. Everybody hates lost souls, even the other demons. Next, map 10, entryway by Charlie Patterson. This bad boy got a spot on Doom World's top 100 most memorable maps, coming in at the 95 slot. Zazer attributes its inclusion mainly to the rocket launcher gimmick. You haven't seen one until now, but every time Doom Guy closes in on the damn thing, you get flim flammed. Bars raise, floors fall away, you're teleported to an entirely different area. But the trolling doesn't stop there. After navigating a series of hallways, you emerge into a metaphorical representation of me trying to get laid three holes, but you can't get into any of them. And when you finally do, the brown one is where all the fun's at. Here you're locked into another series of hallways and moving forward will spring barren infested closets and open walls that allow you to continue. You probably aren't going to have enough ammo to deal with each ambush as it happens, so you'll be railroaded through the entire thing until you can get your hands on a few rocket boxes and an invulm. 
It's a cool sequence. There's also this room just before heading outside. You enter and different layers of demons start lowering. It's a modern idea for a fight, although the challenge is almost non-existent. Still, Project Lead Patterson demonstrates a lot of imagination in this one. Next, Map 11, Command Control by Bill McClendon. Combat's not anything to write home about, but the building is stuffed with plenty of opposition. The yellow key area serves as an appetizer, and it's home to most of the secrets. Gotta say, they're kinda lame. Two of them just take you to the chain gunner ports back at the entrance, with nothing inside either. Two more net you a red armor, and the final one contains a backpack, which you'll never have enough ammo to actually make use of. Anyway, the majority of the map centers around the blue key, in the middle of a large warehouse. The key itself can only be obtained after hitting several switches, all scattered in the various passages and rooms that wrap around the warehouse. It's a little absurd, but there's always something to shoot, and it's not really a maze, so... I'll deal with it. What I don't want to deal with is the invisible hollow bot. Of all the enemies to turn into a specter, why did they choose the slowest? They are really good at blending in if you don't know what to look for. The final fight teleports an Archvile and Baron back in the starting room, so save your rockets. It's a sorely needed adrenaline boost, but still pretty easy. My shitty gameplay notwithstanding. Next, Map 12, Power Station by Bill McClendon. The new mutations of evil are nastier than any ghoul dreamed up by the most opium-starved of poets. Even so, how in the hell did these little buggers spread so far, so fast? A sixth sense tells you to suppress your curiosity. Command control has been cleared, and the power station awaits. You blast one last doppelganger. With your aching fingers, you stuff a dozen more shells in the shotgun before his lifeless body hits the floor. They don't have bodies, but okay. Your transformation is complete. The Pit of Sin better have stronger warriors ahead than these. You know it will. Look, continuity. You're now exploring the subterranean river flowing underneath command control. Apparently the two maps were actually one, but it was too big so they split it up. It might behoove you to go back through the blue door and grab some ammo. You will need it. See, the starting area isn't the only thing these two maps share. That blue key switch hunt has now been extended to the whole goddamn stage. Once you drop down, you gotta go from one end of the crescent to the other, checking every room and pushing every button. These will open a series of doors in the middle area, culminating in the red key and way too many barons. This is even less fun from a pistol start. You can drop down on the left to get a super shoddy, but I'd suggest going right for a chainsaw. These tunnels are crawling with demons, imps, and even cacos, and the rooms are also chock full of monsters, including more barons. It's weird. The Chain Gunner, Archvile, and Hell Knight of all things are the only Doom 2 enemies not outright replaced, and yet Billy Boy refuses to make use of the lesser Hell Noble. Whatever, it's too dark, too tedious, you get plenty of rockets but no launcher, and at the end you have to go back into the previous map, shoot through way too much meat, and find a half-buried teleporter that takes you to god knows where. Next. Map 13, Ruins by David Rotramel. Hot damn, this is a breath of fresh air after those last two maps. You got three keys, each with its own challenge. Yellow is a pretty standard teleport trap. Blue is a series of closets that open up with varying monsters in each one, culminating in a Baron and his doppelganger entourage. Clever setup. If you don't rocket the souls fast enough, it's gonna get real cramped in here. Red is my favorite. You can tackle a lot of it from the door, but I suggest going in balls deep. The walls are lined with fodder and the floor is filled with super imps. The key is up high, protected by a minister of hate. Despite the cool sounding name, it's just a baby cyber demon with a lot less health. You can telefrag him, but it's just as easy to shoot him. One time he got into an infight with the imps and they beat his hobbit looking ass. He also only fires a single rocket. That being said, the rocket still hurts like hell, and I swear it travels faster than normal. Whole map's fun, and Rotramel has the opposite tendency of McClendon. You'll be showered with ammo. Two backpacks, two rocket launchers, and he loads you up for a plasma weapon you don't even have yet. He's also got a better eye for aesthetics. The starting room looks pretty rad, but the final room is a slap in the face, in a good way. You unlock the bars and step through a blood fall to find yourself in a... futuristic tech base? 
Some kind of time machine or teleporter? I have no idea, but it comes out of nowhere and I love it. Next. Map 14, Engineering, by David Graves, Ad Illusion, Nostromo, and Arthur Chang. For a map that basically got gangbanged into existence, it is surprisingly coherent. You got the central office area, which is about as cramped, miserable, and filled with assholes as an actual office. Then you got side rooms that give access to the different keys. I don't know who made what, but the yellow key and the room leading up to the red key are pretty similar. I prefer the latter. You can get pushed into the L-shaped connecting corridor and have to fend off demons from both sides. Then, after some stair shenanigans, you face off against two ministers of hate. Don't grab that invisibility. The blue key and some of the other dead-end rooms aren't very challenging, unless you're hurting for ammo. There's a secret near the beginning, an annoying back-and-forth switch hunt, but the reward is a very handy rocket launcher. You will be dealing with a few barons. Two last points. First, I like the way the place looks. It leans heavily into the computers and silvery sheened tech base vibe. Second, I always enjoy it when they elect to use one of John Landis's less grating middies. Next. Map 15, Subsidiary Power, by Chainsaw. This one goes hard on the atmosphere, and it pays off. You're in some kind of wrecked underground complex, and you'll need to navigate toxic tunnels, craggy caverns, and whatever bits of the power station you can still manage to access. This is all in service of finally getting the lights turned on and opening the exit door. Throughout your journey, walls will explode, passageways will collapse, and your eardrums will die a painful death. I like it a lot. On paper, the most boring part should be the sewer area, just a grid of hallways, but it's littered with a host of low-tier enemies and plenty of barrels. You will want to find the non-secret rad suits tucked away beforehand, or you can play hopscotch with the pools of flickering light. A sector can only have one effect. In this case, it can either have flickering lights or a damaging floor. Interesting design choice. The main room is home to three separate encounters near the end that all have the potential to bust your balls, including an archvial and a minister of hate. The showstopper, though, is right in front of the exit switch, where you're introduced to the Hell Noble's final form, the Demon Lord. When there is no more cocoa butter left in hell, these ashy motherfuckers will walk the earth. It's the biggest and baddest that Strain has to offer. They shotgun fireballs five at a time. Now, they only got about as much health as a Baron and a Hell Knight combined, but you're going to start seeing them a lot more often. Prepare your anus. Next. Map 31. Secret by John Landis. Wait a minute. That switch wasn't in the floor plan. And what kind of place is this? Looks like Darrow has gotten some unexpected renovations. This is not a good sign. You remember earlier when I said I was finally buying what John Landis was selling? I take it back. Can I get a fucking refund? Okay, just reaching the exit isn't that bad, although finding the secrets will help a lot if you're pistol starting. Of course, one of those pops three barons on either side of you in a narrow hallway. So I'll let you decide if the rocket launcher is really worth it. Landis lays out a somewhat symmetrical puzzle map. Just roam around and if you get stuck, backtrack you'll find something that's opened up. As far as that goes, it's an exercise in patience and using the Berserk pack more than anything else. The super secret exit is where my panties officially get in a fucking twist. I still don't know how the hell you're supposed to figure this shit out. It seems simple enough. Once you finally unravel the map, the regular exit displays four sets of icons. During normal play, these same icons will pop up around the level. Okay, so maybe you're supposed to activate them in a certain order. Two questions. How do you activate them? and in what fucking order. As far as I can tell, there's no rhyme or reason to it. I had to look it up, and sure enough, you're expected to go back and forth and do things in the most nonsensical way possible. In One Man Doom's review, he says that the whole thing isn't very hard to puzzle out. So either he's full of it, or I'm fucking dumb. Leaning towards the latter, I just said to hell with it and brought up Doom Wiki, and even with that open right in front of me, I still had to do the same sequence of events three or four times before it decided to work fuck off. Now before we go, I should mention the plasma rifle replacement, the NFG. Functionally, it's identical to the stock version, although there is an increased cooldown period before you can fire again. However, each projectile has a base damage increase of 7, more than doubling the damage output. This is good, because your cells are now capped at 50. I find it to be a strict downgrade from both the electric hose and the BFG. See, the new BFG is a handheld turd launcher, 
We'll talk about it when it shows up, but the point is, you won't be using it very often. Because of this, and the limited ammo, the NFG will basically be your slot 7. It gets the job done in a pinch, but you will miss the energy weapons. Trust me. Oh, and the cell pickups, now called batteries, only offer 3 and 15 ammo a pop. Double O, you can get this weapon on map 16 with half the effort. Triple O, the sprite looks fucking dumb. Next. Map 32, Super Secret by Holger Nathrath and Ad Illusion. And now for something completely different. Blue Danube and Puke Green Wall set the tone for this no-frills action bonanza. It's mostly fighting off waves of enemies, starting with a shotgun or fiesta at the beginning. It's more fun to whiz around and get as much shit spawned in as possible, just for the infight. Unfortunately, there are some bottlenecks that prevent you from getting too crazy, but you also get a couple of involves to help smooth things out. They even make it easier to see the horde of invisible holobots. You'll have to deal with hell nobles, including a couple of demon lords, some cacos, imps, couple of arch vials, and other assorted baddies as you open up new areas. There are also a few ministers of hate, but they're usually locked up. I say usually because sometimes the teleporter doesn't work right, and you'll be forced to waltz with one of the fuckers. Oh well, it's a fun little stage regardless. I'm not sure if it's worth Map 31's bullshit, but hey, that's why Ed Clev exists. Next. Map 16, Living Quarters, by Charlie Patterson and Rick Robb. Well, the good news is that most of the generic map names are now behind us. The bad news is that we're still being subjected to a time-honored PWOD tradition. You press a button and have no clue what it actually does. That being said, Living Quarters isn't too egregious in that respect, and Strain pulls this crap so often I'm getting used to it. I imagine a lot of people will be more put off by the scarcity of armor, or the complete lack of a super shoddy. There are two things I do like about the map the combat, and the layout. The beginning tosses you right in the fray, but all those walking poop socks are actually locked in a basement area that wraps around the starting point. You'll come through there later, so the more jinkum jugs you deal with now, the better. Or you could just use the button-activated crushers to help mop them up. Your choice. Just be careful, there's a couple ministers down there. The red key is kinda interesting, propped up in the middle of these lowering platforms. You're liable to get stuck in here with a demon lord. Don't panic and start hitting buttons or the hills will come alive with the sound of fuck. I also enjoy the little details. You can get the drop on some chain gunners by coming in behind them. There's a build style non-secret alcove holding an NFG. And lastly, the fountain yields goodies to those willing to get their feet wet. I guess the demons make a wish by tossing shotgun shells in there. But something tells me those wishes are not going to come true. Next. Map 17, Promenade, by Holger Nathrath and Arthur Chang. Considering the straightforward gimmick, this isn't half bad, and that's due to the non-stop and varied action. Right off the bat, you're ambushed by holobots and a minister of hate. Then you got a whole lot of chaff to clear out in the ensuing areas. Then you got the hallway. Like a drop of piss trying to escape Ron Jeremy, you gotta make it all the way to the end, where you'll find the red key. On your way through, you'll be forced to stop and wriggle around an increasingly large number of kidney stones. First up, a chain gunner, followed by a room with some caged imps. No big deal. Then the fights start getting a little nasty with a court of hell nobles. Then the fights start getting fucking annoying. You got a room filled with enemies, including a demon lord and some really obnoxious hollow bots that make it hard to camp out at the beginning, which you'll be inclined to do because most of the floor is damaging. Same goes for the next few rooms. To make this one safe, you need to run for the switch that's being guarded by a multitude of meaty motherfuckers. The final fight is actually pretty easy. There's a load of different monsters in a sizable arena. Just run circles. You will become acquainted with the Demon Lord's excellent infighting potential. And then that's it. You finally dribble into the restaurant at the end of the hallway with a nice view of outer space. It's very atmospheric, and no pun intended. You can even go out there, 
through an airlock to get a really pointless computer area map. The Alpha Dog Alliance actually made an invisible monster called the Decompression Demon that would instantly kill the player if they stepped out into the vacuum of space. It was never put in the game and instead they opted to have a simple damaging floor. Just like with map 15, a sector can only have one effect, and since the map counts as a secret, you can stand there with no repercussions. You know, if you just want to drink it in. The secrets are not very good in general, but that's about the worst thing I can say regarding this big swinging some bitch. Next. Map 18, Relay Station, by David Rotramel. Like I said before, Rotramel can give you something nice to look at while you're pummeling bad guys. Although this epilepsy room can fuck off. Also, why is there half a boat in here? Yeah, fuck it. Sometimes you just like a little steam liner in your tech base. Unfortunately, I find the combat to be subpar to his previous outing. Still some good bits and decent traps. The beginning isn't hard, but will put a dent in your health. And this arch vial guarding the yellow key can get you good. But you should be able to tank the hit. That's because, despite the myriad monsters, the difficulty is pretty low and some of the fights just fall flat. A hallway full of holobots, for example. Some of them are invisible, but the biggest challenge is not concussing yourself on the fuckers. Or exactly one demon lord, on a ledge, across the room, with ample cover. Or three arch vials stuck on platforms outside the blue door. Yeah, not exactly setting the world or you on fire. I could also complain about the haphazard back and forth progression thanks to the placement of keys and doors and teleporters that never take you where they should. Special mention goes to the yellow key platform, which desperately needs a wheelchair ramp or something, because the actual way up there is pretty damn obtuse. It all culminates in a mini boss arena filled with the newest addition to Strain's bestiary, the Polydrone. Flying spawn cubes that have a mastermind's chain gun. The worst part is that when they die, their flaming corpses actually hurt. I'm not a fan, and while they aren't very threatening, they can be annoying to deal with for reasons we'll talk about later. On the upside, at least cool looking exit portals have returned. Next. Map 19, Waste Processing, by Daryl Esau. This one feels more on the amateur side, with large, monotextured rooms dominating the poo-poo processing plant. Combat is also pretty rote. Aside from a couple of spicy ambushes on the western side, the biggest challenge is running up to a chain gunner across a wide open expanse before he can chip your health down. That's not to say no thought went into it, just not enough thought. A pseudo mazy area to the south threatens, briefly, to be more interesting than it actually is and the yellow key is hidden inside one of these waste vats. It can hardly be called a puzzle. Took me longer to figure out you can even interact with these things than it did for me to find the key. The author's best strength is secret placement. There's one near the beginning that's got some tight timing. Or at least it did until I realized you could activate the wall from across a gap in the floor. Not sure how or why that works, but I won't look a gift horse in the mouth, especially one that shits out a rocket launcher. Two final reasons to roll my eyes. First, the MIDI. Let's just say Landis isn't quite on the same level as Clem or Shaw. Second, the BFG Trooper. The last custom enemy in Strain actually made his debut all the way back in Map 8, but on my first, second, and third time through, I didn't notice. And I didn't notice him here either until I started poking around in Doom Builder. See, it's a zombie man. And what is a zombie man's purpose in life? To get crushed by their enemies, to die before you, and to have low HP so you can hear the lamentations of their jibs. They almost never even get a shot off, and when they do, it's a slow ass green ball that's easy to avoid. I don't know if it works the same way your BFG does, but I did test it, and had to really go out of my way to get hit. Why they're even in the game is beyond me. Next. Map 20, Reactor, by Driller. Another short one that's meant to give weight to the story, a la Map 7. Here you're given way too much ammo, way too little opposition, and tasked with destroying a reactor that screams when you blow it up. Not much to say about it, although the severed head that provides power to the installation is being guarded by a few polydrones, a minister of hate, and an arch vial, who is easily the most imposing creature in the level. Next. 
Map 21, Maintenance, by Adillusion and Arthur Chang. A flash of realization. You were witness to the destruction of the, quote, very last of the demons on Earth. On Earth, now with the government, the cause of all your troubles? Yeah, no shit. Store these creatures on the moon and experiment on them? Incompetently creating a new strain? You'll handle those in charge. Your way. I have no idea what's going on with the plot, which is fitting because I have no idea what's going on with this fucking map either. If I didn't know any better, I'd say it was a Landis creation, but even his arcane puzzles have more of a point to them. First off, pick the right switch. Literally. If you press the left one, you just die. That right there is giving me Eye of the Beholder flashbacks. Then you're teleported to this area, which is almost completely pointless. There are a bunch of switches that raise and lower the platforms in the nukage, but you can just take a teleporter to the other side. I don't even know what to say about that. Now there is a console here that you will want to hit because it lets you access a secret computer area map later on. We'll get back to that in a minute. Next up is a really stupid quote unquote puzzle. One of these teleporters takes you to a room with a switch and it's always the same teleporter so why even have duplicates? Hitting that switch lowers the switch, revealing another switch. When you try to hit that switch, you teleport back outside, run forward and hit a different switch on this pillar. Then you do it all over again four or five fucking times. What in the hell's the point of that? The final switch takes you to this dumbass room. You have to find a way to the other side. Most of the pillars just teleport you back or crush you. Then you got another stupid time switch thing, and finally another stupid teleporter thing, where you have to make it to the other side. Thankfully, you can't get hurt this time. And if you picked up that computer area map I mentioned earlier, they actually put the fucking solution right next to you, on the auto map. It's nice to know that the authors feel the same way about their shit gimmick as I do. You may have noticed that I didn't mention the combat. That's because there are only 13 enemies. One Baron, two Kakos, two Imps that get crushed automatically, so why are they even here? A few Gunners, and a few BFG Troopers. You already know how I feel about them. But you know what the really great thing is? You can skip all that bullshit and leave the map in 10 seconds. That pointless room at the beginning contains another exit, right next to the teleporter that takes you across the toxic pool. Press the sign to lower it, then press the air because the exit portal isn't a portal, it's a fucking switch. What a bizarre catastrophe. Next. Map 22, Specimen Storage by Adillusion. Here we have a much needed action heavy stage. If you're playing continuously, you'll come in overloaded with ammo and Adillusion drops a lot more on you. From a pistol start, you'll better appreciate the monster placement, which the author uses to catch you off guard or punish people that try to run away. Best fights include the beginning on a floor that lowers into a tight ambush and the blue key room. Here you got two portals that pump out a few enemies. Kill them, hit the switch to reveal a mini boss, then rinse and repeat two more times. You'll be taking everything down piecemeal, and as a result, it's hardly difficult, but still fun. That pretty much describes the whole map, except for the Psychic Blaster. Yeah, you finally get your hands on the BFG replacement. You may want to wash them afterwards. I use widescreen mode so the weapon doesn't look right, but I couldn't be bothered to change my settings for a gun that I'm rarely going to use. It seems like they were trying to create their own super rocket launcher. You know, the super shotgun uses twice as many shells, but throws out almost three times more pellets. Well, the psychic blaster uses three rockets, but a direct hit can deal ten times more damage. If you get lucky, you can one-shot a demon lord. The problem is twofold. One, it's slow. Firing it is slow, and the actual projectile is slow. Two, and perhaps most egregious and fucking retarded, the projectile is invisible. It has the fuzzy specter effect on it. Why? Why, oh why, would you not want to see your own goddamn projectile? Because you can't, and it moves a lot slower, so you can't even rely on muscle memory to tell you where it's gonna be. This has gotta be one of the dumbest decisions I've ever seen. The fucking thing even has handlebars. You know, so the demons have something to hold on to while they fuck your face. To hell with it. Next. Map 23, Dispensary Alpha by Adillusion. This is where the wad starts getting mean. Thankfully, the archivials are reserved for the end when you have enough ordnance to deal with them. But to get there, you'll have to wade through a lot of bullshit. We're talking polydrones, ministers of hate, hell nobles, several demon lords, and gunners galore, all of which will merrily soak up what little ammo you have to throw at them. My biggest piece of advice? Find the Psychic Blaster. I know I just took a dump on it, but it'll be your main heavy weapon for a while. So, uh, 
grab some toilet paper and wipe it off. Of course, actually acquiring the damn thing is an ordeal. You gotta teleport into a small room with a couple of powder puff boys, then take the back side of the teleporter to reach the blaster. That's already a pain, but the real kicker is that the teleporter line death is one time use, and it only activates from the back side. However, for some reason, it still counts as being used even if you cross it from the front and don't actually teleport anywhere. So you can really fuck yourself if you, uh, for example, teleport in, panic because you're about to eat 10 servings of shit, and instinctively backpedal over the line death. If this happens, your time here is going to be very unpleasant. See, the map requires you to constantly run back and forth, hitting switches that open other switches that lower walls leading to more switches. As a result, you'll have to avoid the same enemies over and over if you don't have the means to deal with them. Hell, just leaving the map requires you to teleport five times between two rooms to hit four different buttons. It's worth noting that the whole stage is actually a reworked map 10 from Dystopia 3. This version does round off some of the more annoying edges, but it also introduces a few edges of its own. The most pervasive are of course the new enemies, but then you got stuff like this. A secret where you have to operate a supercomputer from the 19 fucking 50s to access a blueberry. This type of shit takes the pacing out behind a woodshed and fucks it right in the ass. Or how about this wide open expanse out the windows, which used to be empty and is now home to a few polydrones that love to float far, far away when shot. Or a completely out of left field, multiplayer only room with a few green armors and two chain gunners that are not marked multiplayer only. Say goodbye to 100%. Next. Map 24. Sub Laboratory by Adillusion, a sewer troll that's thankfully light on the damaging floors and light on the enemies compared to its predecessor. The corridors are filled with both types of imps, while the bigger fish are relegated to the actual rooms. First one holds the blue key, which springs a god-awful double gangbang on ya. There's a couple of hidden alcoves you can squeeze in to really take the heat off though. A toxic river cuts through this room where you have to take a trip down to the yellow key, and there are some surprises for the unawares, but after that, you're at the exit. You can get stuck in here with two Hell Knights and two Demon Lords though. There's just enough cover to make it doable, but I still prefer to spring the trap and run. When the door shuts, you can only open it from the inside by shooting a switch on the outside. It's a precise shot, especially when you're getting felt up from behind. If that was all the map had, it'd be a decent and relatively quick outing. Unfortunately, Sub Laboratory's got a muffin top. And by that, I mean the middle section is very disappointing. Clear out the gunners, then clear out the demon lords, then clear out the hell knights. Now you're left with two rooms accessible via two lifts. At the top of each lift is a wall that can only be opened temporarily by stepping into the lift on the opposite side. And behind each wall is a baron. Because of the way it's set up, shipping the barons from down here is tedious as fuck, but your only other option is to take the lift into a face full of bright green bullshit. In your reward, a red armor and a soul sphere on a map with four soul spheres. This whole area was balanced quite poorly. The good news is that it's optional. You can easily complete everything else without once dipping in here for supplies, which of course begs the question, what's the point? There is none. Avoid it, unless you're a stickler for completionism. Next. Map 25, Main Laboratory, by Arthur Chang. First up, the Blue Key Wing, a large cylindrical chamber dotted with balconies, most of which can be accessed through a hallway that wraps around the outside. If you're pistol starting, you ain't gonna be having a good time. A berserk pack helps, but there are still gunners, polydrones, and snipers aplenty as you make your way to the final lift. There's also a Demon Lord, who's annoying to deal with no matter what. This time I got lucky and he wandered out onto one of the balconies. Once you grab the key though, you can make a pit stop in this handy dandy armory. Next up, my least favorite, an extremely dark maze. Well, I say maze, it's really not that bad, but when the lights are turned down this low, I could get lost in a fucking cubicle. For some reason, there is a light amp visor, 
at the very end. It's just boring, at least until you spill out into a cavern full of enemies and a well-placed invuln. Then the action picks up again with the pentagram. I guess this is where the demons are coming in from, but I thought they were being engineered by a mad scientist. Nah, who cares? Just let them in fight while Satan or whoever the fuck that is watches from below. Check out this door too. You can tell it's just a warped texture, but it's so bizarre that I like it. The whole thing is more interesting than it is fun, but it's still fun in a lot of spots. Next. Map 26, Main Laboratory 2, by Holger Nathrath, Charlie Patterson, and Rick Robb. I'm not sure where we're at now, but everything's been scaled down a lot, except the invisible holobots, because apparently the authors hate us all. I do like that you can tackle the blue key from two different directions. The intended path forces you to handle the entire room at once, but you have the entire room to run around in. Alternatively, destroy the Demon Lord and open the front door. You'll be trapped in a much smaller enclosure, but the Baron won't see you, so pick your poison. Past the yellow bars is something that reminds me of a subway platform, and the area is full of secrets and ammo if you're paying attention. Speaking of subway, try not to alert everything at once, or you'll be eating more $5 footlongs than a preteen at Fogel's house. Ministers of Hate and the aforementioned Flying Specters are not Doom Guy friendly especially in this lighting. The final fight lifts you up into a Hell Knight ambush, so prepare the normal flipping gun which you should have acquired if you poked your nose around. Certainly don't want to rely on the psychic blaster for this one. Next. Map 27, Dispensary Beta, by Andy Bedoric. The horseshoe to end all horseshoes. You start on one side of the pit and eventually circle all the way around and have the final battle in there. A slow drip of cacodemons. Pretty anticlimactic, but the rest of the stage makes up for it. There are several secrets and plenty of other nooks and crannies besides. To get the yellow key, you have to make a detour into what I imagine is an older, obsolete part of the installation. I like the shit lifts here, which is something I never thought I'd be saying, but they're mainly used to craft a decent combat scenario. There are also these door column things that reveal enemies. A mundane gimmick, but it's cute and quick. The rooms behind the yellow doors have some less interesting ideas, but from there, it's an action-packed run for the finish. It's worth noting that this is about as dangerous as BFG troopers get in the whole wad, which is to say, not very. But there is a closet near the end with six of them, so you know, if the planets align and the stars move and the galaxy wobbles in just the right way, you may actually hear the first half second of their attack before you annihilate them all. Next. Map 28, Unknown, by Bjorn Hermans. And now for something completely different. Well, partially different. The first half of this is a truly bizarre and confusing experience, at least until you figure it out. It is surprisingly straightforward once you do. Most of the wonky atmosphere comes from the floor alone. It must be said, pistol starters will die a lot. You don't get a damn thing until you can scoop a weapon off a dead gunner, which means berserkless punching a few imps in a very tight space. That part is pure luck. Then you need to know exactly which teleporter to take and exactly where to get a gun and enough health to stave off the fusillade of fireballs coming at you from all directions. With that over, the craziness gets reined in a bit. Plenty of holobots and switch shenanigans, but you also get a ton of cell ammo and a fairly obvious NFG. Then the visuals take front and center again with these pitch black hallways, full of trash and a couple of guys you wish were trash. Not too bad though. I noticed three things down here. One, there's a secret that temporarily lowers two switches you need to push to finish the map. If you get stuck, recheck these hallways. Two, the holobots go full bright when they die, which is equal parts amusing and tacky. Three, this would have been a really mean place to spam BFG troopers. So obviously, that didn't happen. To his credit, Hermans does make good use of polydrones in the final room. And by good use, I mean maximum annoyance. Thankfully, the two demon lords at the end can be dealt with using a secret yellow key. This one's grown on me, but more as a spectacle. I find the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay a little less impressive. Next. Map 29, Self-Destruct by Ron Allen. A switch-heavy ordeal in the vein of what's come before, with plenty of monsters to lay down. Most of them are weaker enemies and it works out pretty well, but Alan's use of the higher tier monsters leaves something to be desired. He's always holding back, whether it be nobles stuck on platforms just waiting to be disposed of, a surprise arch vial that tends to get stuck in its starting alcove, or the big finale in this lava cauldron. It looks cool, it plays cool, but then you reach the other side and find a single minister of hate waiting for you. 
anticlimactic. The whole map feels like a bit of a wind down compared to what's come before. Worst part is leaving the two side wings and dropping back down into the beginning area, where you can get mobbed by a fresh supply of enemies. Oh, and the exit is heavily guarded by a single BFG trooper. The ADA severely overestimated these guys. Next. Map 30, Boss, by John Landis and Nostromo. Basic bitch map name, basic bitch map design. This one entices you to waste ammo and health on a few demon lords before the main attraction. I wouldn't bother. 100% kills is impossible. Not that it really matters on an icon stage. So here's the game plan. Romero's head is on a shit lift, and it'll continually bob up and down. And the joke writes itself, so I won't even bother making it. There are four more shit lifts around the perimeter. Ride one up and hope that your lift and the Romero lift sync up long enough for you to shoot him. This sounds a lot worse than it is. I almost never have a hard time actually getting the guy dead. But if you are having a hard time, don't fret. You don't even need to use the damn lifts. Just grab one of the many invulnerabilities scattered around, head right up to the central cage, and let her rip. I have to assume this was intentional, which makes me question why they even bothered with the gimmick in the first place. I guess I'll give it props for not wasting too much of my time, and then I'll take those props back for using that shit Landis MIDI. You've destroyed every last denizen of doom. Period. You also destroyed the general in charge of the space station, who happened to have a severed bobbing head. Weird. It's over. This should impress babes. Then again, you are a bloated, psychic, freaky madman now. Perhaps you can start a game company and write 3D engines with your altered brain. That should cause the competition to sputter and jerk and blather out unrealistic claims. Thanks for playing the Alpha Dog Alliance. That's it for Strain. Favorite maps? On the shorter end, I enjoyed stuff like Industrial Zone, Cargo Bay, Super Secret, and Specimen Storage. But I think Map 13, Ruins, and Map 15, Subsidiary Power, are real standouts. Some of the longer maps were also pretty fun, but I gotta give it to Map 23, Dispensary Alpha, and Map 27, Dispensary Beta. The former does not fuck around, which I enjoy especially given that the whole wad is fairly low on the difficulty scale. The latter is just a good fun romp, and honestly would have made for a better map 29 than self-destruct, in my opinion. All that's not to discount some of the more interesting fare, like entryway, promenade, or main laboratory. Hell, I'll even give shoutouts to launch control and unknown, though I'm not in too much of a hurry to replay them. Least favorite maps. <laughs> Speaking of interesting levels, Secret is kind of annoying, but it is optional. Power Station is a dark, dank slog for sure, and waste processing could have used more time in the oven. But Map 21, Maintenance, is without a doubt the big turd on campus. The fact that I listed more favorites than least favorites should clue you in. Strain is pretty damn good. Doom World listed it as one of the top 10 wads of 97 for a reason, after all, and it wasn't just for the excellent soundtrack. That's not to say it doesn't have problems. It can be a little obtuse, and the dehacked editions are generally not that great. But, like I said earlier, at least they tried. There was an attempt to bring something to the table. It's just that Doom 2 had already laid out a five-course meal, and Strain tried replacing the filet mignon with a fucking Big Mac. You know, 97 was a year that saw many visions of what the franchise his future could look like. Eternal Doom, Hell Revealed, Doom 64. In that sense, Strain is like an alternative follow-up, one of the many what-ifs regarding a hypothetical Doom 3. And regardless of all that, it is highly recommended, although you might want to keep a guide handy. Till next time.